Now we're going to get into more esoteric uh, management options for common bile duct stones. Um, I, I'll make a quick comment too. Um, for those of us, you know, I, I fully realize and appreciate that m the vast majority of general surgeons in this country are, do not have uh, ERCP uh, technical skills. Um, and so you're, you're getting a little bit of a skewed point of view. Those large stones that we saw in all of those with, with the electrohydraulic lithotripters that we have today, the holmium YAG lasers that we have today, if everybody's seen the spyglass, which is a Boston Scientific product um, that we have today in the mother-daughter access, we can actually fragment those stones through a standard sphincterotomy and then pull those out, um, eliminating the need for many of these other techniques. But having said that, there are occasions, and that's going to parlay into my talk, when you cannot get to the common bile duct. You can't get it to it operatively, and you can't get to it through a scope. So when does that happen, and what do you do? So I have no disclosures. So here's, here's the indications or the rationale. You say, why the heck would anybody do a PTHC? when I can take them to the operating room or I can get some advanced gastroenterologist who may have a double balloon access or go, to, go, you know, go down a rule limb and get up to the common bile duct. Well, they, they can do it in theory, but in practice uh, at Ohio State, uh, on rare occasion when they've uh, attempted to do that, they've been relatively unsuccessful. Um, but the rationale is, is for whatever reason, if you're unable to perform an ERCP in a stone extraction, they have anatomic changes. Somebody's had a rui gastric bypass. I can't tell you how many patients who are post rui gastric bypass who come in with common bile duct stones. The stones are too large for endoscopic removal. So very often what will happen is I'll get consulted secondarily. They've come in, they've seen a hospitalist, they've seen an internal medicine doctor who's referred them to a gastroenterologist who's performed an ERCP, can't get the stones out, they know there's altered uh, surgical anatomy for whatever reason, and then we're consulted, um, or for technical failure. Um, some, some of these patients are very high surgical risk. Some of these patients uh, um, don't want to have an operation, and they're unwilling to undergo an operation. And on, on a, a couple of occasions, um, when I've talked to patients, they don't want to go in the operating room, they don't want an open common duct, they don't want a laparoscopic common bile duct exploration. This is an alternative option. Um, and the last one is somebody who's a post-colostectomy um, and this uh, or biliary surgery that already has percutaneous access. And this is actually the scenario that we find most of the time. These patients are at an outside facility. There's no gastroenterologist. The surgeon may or may not be comfortable performing a common duct exploration but they have an interventional radiologist who puts a PTC catheter in and then they ship them. So this is a, this is a, a sample case that I'll, that I'll go through the video and show you. This is just a big stone and somebody, as you can see, has had their gallbladder out. So you're gonna go into a reoperative field, but somebody put a PTC catheter in them first. So somebody else got to this patient before I ever got to this patient. And this is what it's gonna look like through the scope. I'm gonna spend most of my time here showing you this video. Can you pause the video? So, so what you see here is this is happening um, in the interventional radiology suite. This is not happening in the operating room. Um, this does not have to be done under general anesthesia. It can actually be done under conscious sedation. Our preference is to do general anesthesia because the dilation, the manipulation of the biliary tree can make those patients pretty uncomfortable. So what you can see here in the background, that's the anesthesiologist. Patient's head's right here. This is one of my interventional radiology colleagues. And this is just an opening shot to kind of give you the lay of the land and where we do this, this kind of work. So, so the patient is fully prepped to drape, and that's a catheter that you see on the right side in this patient. Now this is important. Somebody mentioned earlier about a 14 French. 
okay? Is that a percutaneously placed catheter? It's a percutaneously placed catheter. Mm -hmm. It is a 12 French catheter. You cannot fit a ureteroscope, which is the same thing as a laparoscopic cholidocoscope, 3.2 millimeter, through anything smaller than a 12 millimeter cholangia catheter. So very often when your radiologist will put these catheters in, they'll put an eight and a half or a 10 French catheter in initially, these will have to be upsized to a 12. You cannot put a scope through a uh, um, catheter any smaller than 12 French. And they'll start and they'll get a nice cholangiogram for us. Whoops. Oh. Jeff, while you're rewinding that, let me say the Stortz just started to make a smaller cholidocoscope, which I think is 2.8 millimeters, so it may go through a 10 French catheter, theoretically. I have uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The other option, uh, the other option is use spyglass. Yes. Uh, which um, uh, this goes through 3.2. So you can see here the stones, see some distal stones on this cholangiogram. So our, our interventional radiologist will start, they'll get us a cholangiogram. We'll get the lay of the land, we'll figure out what we need to do, how many stones, where we need to go, and this is, what, this is, this is where I come in. And this, this ureteroscope is going right through that 12 French sheath. And we'll pan away here to the screen, and then we'll show you another video of the actual visualization. It's wonderful visualization. So we're going through the right biliary tree into the common hepatic duct, um, uh, beyond the uh, cystic duct, uh, common duct junction, and into the uh, uh, distal common bile duct. This is access. Um, this is just a quick video of the access that our interve interventional radiologists obtain. And we're pointing to the stone And the stone is up here. And as you saw, the sheath was actually down here in the common hepatic duct. So you have to be very, very sensitive to that because uh, with this technique, you cannot go turn backwards. So you've got to talk to your radiologist. The radiologist has to be there. Um, you, everybody's got to be on the same page. And what they'll do for us is they'll pull the sheath back if this small stone that was sitting right here is proximal to the end of your 12 French sheath. So that was really purely to show uh, um, the technique by the interventional radiologist to go ahead and pull that sheath back. Once we've got the sheath back, we'll reintroduce the scope, and this is a, a wonderful view of the common duct. This is the wire. Um, this can be problematic, and I'm gonna show you why. So we keep this in place. It's a safety valve for the interventional radiologist. It creates some problems moving the scope around. And getting around the wire, it tends to pin the scope into parts of the duct. This is going through into the duodenum, so we've actually gone through the uh, um, ampulla. We've come back into the duct here, and I'm glad I got this piece. What, did, what, did, what just happened? You broke your scope. I broke I my scope. That's exactly what happened. That so, just cost you about... $5,000. Uh, yeah, well, it didn't cost, it cost a hospital, it didn't cost me a dime. Um, but th these are very fragile scopes. They're very small, they're ureteroscopes, um, and you're working through a long sheath, and I'm having to put a lot of torque on these scopes. And what happened here is I was actually torqued up and around the guide wire that the interventional radiologist had placed into the common duct. And just through the sheer torquing, not bending or twisting, sheer torquing of the scope, I destroyed the scope. And I broke, I don't know, 10, 15% of the fibers in the scope. So that's what it looks like when you start breaking fibers. It's, it's actually kind of a cool feeling. It's kind of a crunchy feeling when they start it's going. Very and, cool. And, uh, um, Were you able to proceed with that scope? I, absolutely. So I just got a new scope. Oh. So I had, I had him go downstairs. There goes uh, the budget. And get me a new scope. And, uh, and that's what they did. So this is actually the second scope in the exact same patient. All the fibers, as you can see, are, are working just fine. So then once you get the scope in, you visualize the stones. What was it? Oh. 
we go back, thank you. Once you get in and you visualize the stones with the new scope, um, you have a couple of options. You can pass a basket. Um, and the problem with the basket is you gotta pull that out. If you get the stone engaged, you gotta pull it out through the ducts, into the 12 sheath, out through the 12 French sheath and all the way out. Not easy to do, not a good option. Same thing with the balloon. So I, I've used really, really two tools quite extensively. I used to use the Holmium YAG laser. Um, and it's nice, it's thin, it's like a thick, head, a thick piece of hair, fits through the scope very, very nicely. The problem with that is it drills little holes. It's like a little, it's just like it's what it sounds like, it's a little laser. And you end up with, with a, um, a, a common bile duct stone that's got little holes through it. Um, and then years, years ago, I actually uh, realized and got introduced to the electrohydraulic lithotriptor. And that's exactly what you're seeing here is the electrohydraulic lithotriptor. You just put them up under direct visualization and hit the button, boom. And it's really, really nice. As you can see here, what you do is you just fragment this stone. So the stone gets fragmented, you pass the electrohydraulic lithotriptor, bang away. Very, very safe, much safer than the Holmium YAG laser. Not that that's unsafe, but it's, um, there, there's very little to worry about with this. And as you can see, you just continue to blast away. And all you do is you create this debris field and fracturing and breaking up these stones. And then here's the last part of the video here, and I'm gonna show you the stone in the distal common bile duct. It's a great little, little video right there. And all I do is I just take the end of the scope and I push it through and push it into the duodenum and boom, you're done. Now the disadvantages, somebody's gotta have a PTC catheter in. The radiologists, um, whenever they manipulate it, downsize it or anything, typically like to wait two weeks before they pull it out. If we're gonna go down this route with the patient or the patient already has one in, you're probably looking at um, potentially a couple of treatments um, to clear the duct uh, and a prolonged stay of a percutaneous transhepatic cholangia catheter. So you have to talk the patients through that. Um, So in conclusion, um, it's actually um, a very viable alternative for stone clearance in patients incapable of having their stones removed endoscopically and or are unable or unwilling to undergo an operation. And we, we increasingly see these patients, and this is not an uncommon, I, I perform um, a couple of, usually one or two of these a month, and very often the patients are referred to me well after the fact, before a surgeon, before a gastroenterologist has ever been involved, and the percutaneous access is already in, in place. And as I mentioned, if it, it requires prolonged biliary access and often multiple procedures to ensure clearance of all the stones. And we've been in situations where you clear somebody, um, they'll come back in two weeks, the interventional radiologist will re-image their duct and stones that have either been hiding up in the uh, hepatic ducts or fragments that you thought were large enough to go ahead and pass, didn't actually pass. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions and thank you. Good question. <laughs> Jeff, uh, one thing that uh, I mentioned before, I, and I've seen it in Japan, is they will use again a balloon through, after breaking the stone into small, they will do a balloon sphincteroplasty antegrade uh, to make a bigger opening so you can flush smaller debris through that. I think as we see patients with these new complicated bariatric operations like the single anastomosis duodenal ileostomy, which the hell that is, these the SADI operations where you have no access to the duodenum, we're gonna be required to do things like this, so. Uh, Jeff? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, you know, we used to have an electrohydraulic lithotriptor at our place but the nurses told me it was outlawed, so they got rid of it. That's not, has not happened, has it? Uh, to the best, unless I'm breaking the law, not that I'm aware of. Okay. No, not at all. It's, um, yeah, I, I, I struggled with the homie and I didn't struggle. It's very, very easy to use, but it takes forever. You get a big stone in there, and all you're doing is you're drilling these little holes in the stone, and the EHL just, boom. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very nice. 
Yes. Um, the question I had for yeah. you is, is uh, what do you charge for this patient? What CPT code? Uh, I, char I charge for cholangioscopy and fragmentation and removal of common bile duct stones. And the interventional radiologist charges for percutaneous cholangiography. I got a scenario for you. Yeah, but a scenario. So you have a ruin white gastric bypass patient that has cholangitis and they come in and they're septic. So the interventional radiologist has done a PTC. Do you try and clear the duct percutaneously and then do a cholecystectomy or do you do everything in one procedure? And also, if you're gonna send them home, do you internalize their PTC? Yeah, so, um, so initially, we get them over the cholangitis. Um, that's, not a, that's not a fight you wanna get into. Um, assuming they recover from the cholangitis, then I would treat the PTC just like an ERCP. I would clear their duct. I'd clear their duct before I'd ever do a cholecystectomy. I'd internalize the stent, leave it in, do a cholecystectomy, because that's gonna protect you. I mean, in case you have a bile leak or some complication after cholecystectomy, um, allow them to recover and then have, uh, you know, traditionally remove that PTC catheter thereafter. I know question. Yeah, Let's uh, take two more questions yeah. and then we'll go on. I believe in this case it was impossible to do any ERCP, but do you consider sometimes using the uh, guide wire as a, a PTC guide wire as a guide for doing the ERCP to make a rendezvous, so to speak? We have, we have done that in the past, um, but the, the typical scenario for these patients is they're after a gastric bypass, so then the standard cholidocoscope, now you're looking at double balloon technology. I do not do double balloon. I don't know how to do it. I've never been taught, and I don't know that I want to learn, um, to be quite honest with you. Um, but it, to your point, very often we actually have to pull that wire back, and our, you know, it makes my interventional radiologists, they're, they're just different. And, and I mean that in a positive way, they always want to maintain access. And whenever they start pulling wires back and they quote unquote lose access, they get very, very nervous. But I talk to them and I say, listen, I'm, never, I'm not gonna leave the duct, you know, um, and I'll let you put the wire back in before I ever back out. Yes, sir. So uh, Fernando from uh, Dartmouth, um, that was a very nice video. I've actually um, I wanted to ask you um, about some experiences that I've had. So we've had patients that are poor operative candidates for cholecystectomy for medical reasons, and they ended up with percutaneous cholecystostomy tubes. And so for those patients, we actually, uh, two of them, we removed uh, stones from the gallbladder using the similar technique through a sheath, used a laser for the ones that were big and, and baskets for the small ones. It was a bit tedious, but the other thing we were able to do is actually pass a wire through the cystic duct down into the CBD and duodenum, and drive a scope over that wire and just make sure things were clear. So just curious if you had experience with a percutaneous trans gallbladder approach like that. Yes, actually we have. A couple things, important points. Um, we've actually, we've, we've done it in two different scenarios. There's a scenario where the cystic duct is patent. So, you know, people get, they get sick, they get a cholecystostomy tube, then they get sent to Ohio State. Um, if, if that cystic duct is patent and the gallbladder isn't terribly diseased, and it's an elderly patient who just refuses surgery or we can't operate on for whatever reason, we'll go ahead, per, as you said, percutaneously clear that gallbladder out, make sure there's no stones anywhere else, and then just leave their gallbladder in. But if that cystic duct is occluded, you can do that, you can clear it, you can do what it, you know, whatever you need to do, but at some point in time before that catheter comes out, that gallbladder's gotta go at some point before you remove that catheter. Now, on rare occasion, we've had people that are s such a prohibitive operative risk, they take that to the grave. They take that cholecystostomy tube to the grave with them.